What is up guys? Welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and in today's video I'm going to be building the best value RTX 3060 Ti gaming PC build that I could possibly put together. I'm going to run you through all the parts I chose and why, the build process step by step from start all the way through to finish before booting this machine up to see exactly how this 3060 Ti performs in around 15 of the most popular AAA titles. Without any further ado though, let's dive into it. As always, I'm going to kick things off by installing as many components into our motherboard today as possible before we go ahead and move the whole kind of assembly into the case. Specifically, this is the MSI B550M mortar board with 4 RAM DIMM slots, plenty of M.2 expandability and cool features such as a built-in rear I.O. shield with a 2.5 gig Ethernet port, speedy, uh, it's going to do the job nicely today and also give you some good upgrade paths to Ryzen 5000. Talking of which, the CPU I've selected today is not actually a Ryzen 5000 chip and that's for good reason. They are currently a lot more expensive than Ryzen 3000 and the 3600 I've selected today hasn't been replaced yet, only the 3600X. This is still going to be a great match for our 3060 Ti at a really good price point. Installing the CPU is pretty simple. We're going to pull back this arm on our CPU socket and then simply line up the gold triangle on the bottom corner of our CPU with the corresponding one on our motherboard today. That's then going to really nicely slot into place. It doesn't require any force or any pressure and the arm pops nicely back down. It makes sense then to install the CPU cooler next up today. I've stuck with the included AMD stock cooler. It comes free in the box with your CPU and while it doesn't give you loads of overclocking headroom, it's cheap cheerful, pretty quiet and keeps the CPU more than cool enough. To install this we need to remove these black plastic brackets which are held on with these four silver screws. That's going to reveal four little black posts, that's the back plate and that's going to stay exactly where it is. If your CPU cooler is brand new it will have thermal paste already pre-applied but because I've used that cooler before a little dab of thermal paste, sort of no bigger than a grain of rice, needs to go on our processor first off. We're then going to use the four screws on our CPU cooler to secure it through these back plate holes we talked about just a second ago. It's a good idea to screw each post in a little bit before going round and tightening them all up in a cross pattern. The final step with our cooler then is just to plug up this four pin PWM fan cable to this port right here on the top of the motherboard today. The next step then is to install the RAM. To do this we need to pull back the second and fourth clips on the second and fourth DIMM slots to make way for our Team Group T-Force Delta RGB memory. Available in 3200 or 3600 megahertz kits, this is consistently some of the cheapest RAM out there on the market, plus this one's RGB, which let's be honest can never hurt. You want to line up the notch on your RAM DIM slot with the corresponding notch on the RAM DIM, even pressure to both sides and we're pretty much good to go. There we go, and just like that, the motherboard assembly, as we're going to call it, is pretty much complete. Now then, with the motherboard assembly nicely complete, it's about time to move it into the case choice for today. This right here is the AeroCool Atomic. And this is kind of like a premium case offering from AeroCool, which, yeah, I know, is a bit of a surprise, uh, that doesn't actually break the bank. We've also got a peel. You ready, cameraman? and the magnetic swing hinged door it seems. And then also in the front of the case, if you look here, we've got a large 200 millimeter intake fan and that's gonna make sure the whole system stays nice and cool. It also seems like we've got a vertical GPU mount as well, which I don't think I've ever seen in an aero cool chassis, but I'm not knocking it, we might use it, could look cool. If you spin the case round to the back, you'll find a little bag and this has all the screws and stuff we need to install the motherboard today, as well as pre-rooted managed cables. I'm, I'm shook at this budget, genuinely. Now we've got all those screws nicely on our table today, we just need to make sure that through each of the holes on our motherboard, circled in white, that we've got a corresponding standoff in our case, also circled in white. It's then simply going to be a case of sliding that motherboard into the chassis today using the included screws that come with your case, just like so. There we go, the motherboard is now in, and before we go ahead and install the graphics card, which I know you're all waiting for, 
it makes sense to plug up some of our cables and our wiring while everything is still easy to access. I've gone for the AeroCool Aero Bronze 600 watt power supply. Not only is it 80 plus bronze certified, but it's got all black cables, which is kind of rare for a budget PSU. And it has pretty good reviews with enough wattage for our build and even a few upgrades today. Now, because the chassis today has got a filtered intake at the bottom, we're gonna go for a fan down orientation. The PSU is then gonna nicely slide into the back of the case and just secure down in these four corners with these included screws. I'm also gonna install our storage today because we can wire that up at the same time. You've got a couple of options here. You can go for a more pricey M.2 drive, but if you're trying to maximize value, a two and a half inch SSD like the Barracuda Q1 is a great choice. One terabyte is gonna give you kind of the optimal capacity in my opinion, but if you've already got a hard drive laying around that you can add on, a 480 gig drive is also gonna do you quite nicely. This case comes with a handy dandy sled today that we can just remove, and that's gonna hold our two and a half inch drive nice and securely into place. That's just gonna secure nicely back down in the same way that we plugged it in, and we can then give it power with one of these SATA power connectors, a little something like this, as well as giving it data by taking this included SATA data cable from our motherboard, plugging one end up to the SSD and the other to the right hand side of our motherboard today. I'm also going to go ahead and install the CPU power connector, which goes to the top left of the motherboard, something like this, as well as our 24 pin motherboard power cable, which is the largest connector of all of them in this video and goes to the right hand side of our motherboard today. The front panel cables are next up. HD audio for the headphone and mic jacks goes to the bottom left of the motherboard. USB 3 today goes to the bottom right hand side of the motherboard, just like this. And then finally, our JFP1 connectors for our power, reset, hard drive indicator LEDs, all that good stuff go to the bottom right of the motherboard too. These can be fiddly, but hopefully the diagram on screen now should help you out. Don't panic, these are fiddly, but nothing will break or explode if you get them wrong. Okay then, and that brings us nicely on to the graphics card today, which I know you've all been waiting for. This is the brand new MSI NVIDIA RTX 3060 Ti. And let me say, I've had a play with this over the weekend and I'm pretty blown away. This is a major step up from something like a 2060 Super. And granted, this does have a slight price increase. It is the TI model, it is the next generation. But even still, it gives you all the ray tracing power you'd want at 1080 and even 1440p. And when you disable ray tracing and enable DLSS, you're getting some insane triple figure frame rates at 1440p, 1080p, and dare I say it, occasionally 4K. Now this build isn't geared up for 4K, that's not what the intention is. It's a 1080 and 1440p powerhouse that's gonna give you some incredible gaming experiences. With the new NVIDIA Ampere architecture, the latest iteration of NVIDIA's RT cores, and in this case, an insane cooler from MSI. Here we go smooth. This card is insane and it's also got a second 8-pin PCIe power connector which I haven't seen on any 3060 Ti that I've played with just yet and for all my 3060 Ti content check out this playlist in the card section here. Builds, setups, the full shebang. Now we could install the graphics card using the vertical GPU mount but I think as far as airflow is concerned the standard bit of a squeeze, there we go, the standard horizontal orientation is probably going to be the best shout. I left the, pla <laughs> I left the plastic cover on the PCIe slot. That's not going to work is it? With that being said though, I'm super pleased with how this build has turned out. It's a bit of a pocket rocket, in my opinion, without breaking the bank. The video is not done yet though. We need to see how well this system performs in a load of the most popular titles at 1080 and 1440p. Before that though, let's see how good it looks when it's all powered up in, in, the in typical Geekawatt style with an epic glam montage. Let's do this. Okay then, now we've seen how to put this system together step by step and just how good it looks when it's all powered up, let's dive in and see how it performs in a load, and I mean a boatload, of the latest titles. 
Death Stranding is first up, 1440p high settings with DLSS enabled and set to quality. So you've got a bit of AI powered upscaling, if you will. Gives you 130, 120 and 110. And that's the average 90 and 99th percentile result. GTA 5 is once again pretty good, 1440p high settings gives you 111 FPS on average, around 17 less than a 3070, but of course this card and build as a whole are much cheaper, with 190 for the 90 and 99th percentile results in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. Control is next, 1440p uh, RTX enabled uh, with DLSS set to 960p, gives you 80, 71 and 60 frames per second with a really playable gaming experience. Apex Legends is next at 1440p high with the frame rate cap disabled uh, in the Origin launcher, gives you 165, 152 and 115 FPS respectively. Call of Duty's Warzone is next up, 1440p high gives you 185 and 74 FPS for the average 90 and 99th percentile results respectively. And the new COD Black Ops Cold War at 1440p high, so similar settings, but this time with the lag busting reflex tech enabled and RTX on, C75, 69 and 64 FPS. At the campaign mode for Cold War is awesome. If you haven't checked it out, go and check it out. It is great. Interestingly, I also tested at 1080p high with the same settings and didn't really see too much of an FPS result. One or two FPS more on the 90 and 99th percentiles, but no scaling really at 1080p. Forza Horizon 4 is next. I always use this. It's a really good kind of uh, benchmark of all my systems. 1440p ultra settings gives you 107, 191 FPS uh, in the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. You can go and check out all my other builds and compare and contrast them. Overwatch is next up. An easier game to run today, but a very popular one nevertheless. 1440p Ultra gives you 174, 155 and 140 frames per second. Esports level frame rates at 1440p. CSGO is next, really easy to run but once again super popular. 1440p high settings, it gives you 322 FPS. Next up then is Minecraft RTX, the beta. It is still a little bit unstable and your mileage may vary. Mine has significantly, uh, but with this build, 1440p with RTX on and an eight chunk render distance, the normal recommended amount for Minecraft RTX, gives you 95, 84, and 76. Of course, you're gonna be seeing three or 400 in the non-RTX version, but the game looks stunning in this beta, despite its instability. Doom Eternal's next 1440p Ultra Nightmare, and this card edges out both the Gigabyte Eagle and the Founders from my testing by a few FPS points. 167, 160, and 151 is a mighty good showing, with a really good test here of overall rasterization. Rainbow Six Siege, the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode is next up 1440p very high settings gives you 166 141 and 135 once again pretty nice result and looked fantastic visually valorant is next up today another easier game to run but very popular and of course supports nvidia's new lag busting reflex tech 1440p high settings with reflex enabled gives you 239 215 and 188 frames per second for those average 90 and 99th percents. Watch Dogs Legions is the penultimate game on my list today. I love the visual kind of quality and look and overall feel of this game. It's awesome. 1440p very high, ray tracing enabled, DLSS enabled, so you get in the visual impact of ray tracing with the extra frame rate DLSS provides. It brings you to 73, 70, and 63. This proved to be a really great gaming experience, and the fact you can stay above that 63 FPS pretty much the entire time is absolutely key. Fortnite is the final game today then, 1440p, high settings with ray tracing off, so we're gonna get a bit more frame rate there, and DLSS on, giving you even more FPS, brings you to 200, 174, and 110 for the average 90 and 99th percentile results. Fortnite looks fantastic at these super high frame rates, and it really will help you get that competitive edge. With that being said, though, that pretty much wraps it up, not only for the benchmarks today, but for the whole video. If you did enjoy it, you know what to do. Thank you very much for watching. Get subscribed, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.